So let's go through some facts about IVF now that I think are really important. And we're going to run through these. We'll talk about this on future episodes. I also want to mention I did an interview with Jennifer Lal, which was fascinating. She's an expert on uh, egg donations, sperm donations. She's investigated big fertility for over a decade. And she's done documentary films. Her documentary film, Exploitation, was about the egg donation industry and how exploitative it is of women. Check out that interview I did. It's over on the live action channel and you'll hear a lot more about big fertility and IVF industry there. But I wanna run through some important facts that you need to know. First of all, I need to say this. Infertility is a big cross. It is. I know people who struggle with it. It's extremely painful, excruciatingly painful for many couples. And unfortunately, because of many environmental factors, I think because of the use in the past of hormonal birth control, other aspects of how we just operate today in the modern world, infertility is increasingly common. People delaying having babies. So more and more people are turning to IVF. But just because something is technologically possible doesn't mean that it's the moral decision and doesn't mean that it's the right decision. I also wanna call out an important distinction head on about the difference between IVF and adoption. IVF is creating a new human life that's gonna be now fraught with a lot of dangers to that life, we're gonna talk about that, as opposed to adoption, which is healing a wound of providing parents for a new human life that's already been created. So in IVF, the parents or the adults want to heal the wound that they are experiencing of infertility by bringing a life or multiple lives into existence to try to have a, a child that they can give birth to, right? With adoption, it's a baby that's already been conceived, that is orphaned ultimately and needs parents. And so the wound of being orphaned is being healed for that child. This is a tremendously important distinction because IVF is focused on meeting the parents' needs by delivering a child one way or another. Adoption is focused primarily on healing the child's needs and solving the child's needs by providing a child who already exists with parents when that child has been orphaned or is otherwise in danger. So wanted to call that out because some people say, how can you be against IVF? You're, you're pro-life, I thought. There's an important distinction here about what these are used for in the, wor in the world, and IVF is used for the parent to have that child they, demand, they really seek or demand. Adoption is to get that child the parents that that child needs. Let's run through some of the challenges with IVF that many people may not know. Number one, there are very high death rates for babies in IVF. IVF is extremely dangerous for the new human lives that are created. I'm gonna cite some studies here. For example, according to research published in the Reproductive Biomedicine, um, Biomedicine Online, in vitro fertilization is carried out 2.5 million times annually around the world. But each year, only half a million babies are actually born from the IVF procedure. This means that each year, if just one embryo is created during each IVF cycle, the average is seven cycles for IVF, at least 80%, at least 2 million of these human beings created through IVF are either dying through the process of IVF because it's hard, you have to go through on, often multiple cycles for the baby to catch, to be implanted, or they're frozen indefinitely. There's an estimated 1 million children frozen indefinitely right now in the United States, or they're destroyed. Many children are seen as not up to the bar in the quality of the embryo that they are, or they're the wrong gender, they're the wrong sex, and so they're simply destroyed. So there are very high death rates for babies in IVF. In this way, IVF promotes the discarding of extra embryos, which are developing humans. Again, we know when human life begins, it begins at fertilization. These are unique individual human boys or girls. Their genetic code's fully present. They just need time and nourishment to grow. They need that nurture. But the reality is IVF usually entails the creation of multiple embryos. That way there's a greater chance of implantation. That's why so many are frozen. You know, they're the leftovers. Maybe we'll have them in the future, maybe we won't. And then these embryos are screened for genetic disorders, handicaps, or even for their gender. Over 70% of US fertility clinics allow screening just for gender. So you can literally destroy the baby if you don't like the sex of the baby, and this is common practice. And then the undesirable embryos are discarded. 
This is absolutely heartbreaking, right? It's treating human lives like commodities. And yet this is common practice, unfortunately, in today's, and it's perfectly legal, in today's IVF industry. Another truth about IVF people should know. IVF often can result in the conception of multiples. So there's a practice by many fertility clinics, not all and not all couples, but by many, where multiples might be implanted because there's a higher, higher chance of one of the babies succeeding than the, the kind of rate of seven maybe cycles of IVF and then it fails, the baby doesn't catch and then the, you know doesn't implant properly or doesn't develop properly. Tragically, in many cases, there's some famous stories out there of women who actually share in their Slate article writing about how, oh, I implanted three, I only wanted one or two, the babies all took, and now the doctor's telling me it's dangerous to have triplets, so I'm going to selectively reduce, is what they use, the, the language they use. Selective reduction is the euphemistic language that's used to talk about these babies, and what that is is an abortion, often a second trimester abortion, because that's kind of when you know whether they'll take or not, so to speak. If they've made it through the first trimester, that's when most miscarriages happen. So they're in the second trimester. It's like, oh, the baby hasn't died yet. It's still alive. Dang it. We better selectively reduce. And so what is legal in this country is you can go in and a baby that you intentionally conceived, this wasn't like a one night stand and an accidental conception and you're like, I don't want responsibility. You paid money to conceive this new little life. And now you think, oh, I don't want this baby anymore because it was supposed to die and it didn't. So I'm gonna go in and kill it. I'm gonna go in and abort it. And so we permit in this country selective reduction where we abort IVF conceived babies and there's no consequence. There's no recourse for their, there's no human rights, no legal status. Another fact about IVF that people should know Prepping for IVF requires significant alterations to the hormone levels in a woman so that she can be ready to receive this pregnancy, right? I mean, it's the baby's already conceived, but now she has to prepare her body and trick it into thinking it's pregnant in just the right way so that the baby will implant in her uterus, right? The reality of that, though, is that going through this hormone therapy for women, besides being very taxing, very expensive, often very painful, it can also have consequences. Having these high levels of estrogen to kind of trick your body into thinking it's pregnant can cause irregular periods. It can cause depression, uterine fibroids, osteoporosis, memory loss, and infections. So this isn't a walk in the park for the mothers either, for the women. This is incredibly taxing, both physically and emotionally, as well as dangerous for women to be doing this unnatural process of preparing and priming their body for an embryo that wasn't conceived in their body. Another fact about IVF that people should know. Advances with IVF has permitted parents to have a screening process where they can make sure that the baby that they're bringing into the world has desirable traits and has no genetic defects. So what happens in many clinics is these children are subjected to genetic testing to ensure they fit the parameters of what the parents want. You see this a lot even before the fertilization of that embryo when the parents, if it's like a same-sex couple, is shopping for an egg or a sperm of another individual. And so you actually see them setting the bar for what they want in that egg donor per se. There is an infamous YouTube couple recently two men that were very public about their IVF journey. And they went through this long process to get, I think they ended up getting 10 frozen embryos, 10 babies, and who knows how many they tried to create before that. And then they brought into the world two little boys through surrogates, but they're joking on camera on their YouTube channel. This is Shane Dawson and his same sex partner. They're joking about how they were looking for a beautiful, you know, a very pretty woman, an attractive woman with certain qualities to be the egg donor because they want their kids to be attractive. And so they're literally shopping like you'd shop for clothes or a car or a house or whatever. They're shopping for their child. And then they don't just shop for the child. They do some magic or their, their technology. You know, they pay a boatload of money, by the way. There's no vetting here either. It's not like Shane Dawson has to go through some lengthy 
approval process like you do for adoption. He can just buy those eggs from a, from a sperm or from an egg donor. And then they go through this process in the IVF clinic of saying, okay, well, how many boys do we got? How many girls? Oh, we don't want the girls. We just want the boys. Okay. Oh, we just want two. We don't want three. So now there's eight babies. Maybe there were more originally indefinitely frozen that may end up getting discarded. That means killed or donated for medical experimentation later down the line. And meanwhile, because of IVF, Shane Dawson and his same-sex partner, his, his, the, the other man, are bringing home to their home two babies that share maybe a biological link to only one of them and has a mother out there that was the donor that they'll never know. They'll never know a mother. And we, there's no, there's no check-in process on how are they doing, how's this baby, how's this family. It's done because they had the money to pay for it. That is what IVF has allowed parents to screen out embryos with genetic disabilities and to basically create super babies, the baby of their design. And if you have enough money and you can go through enough cycles and hire enough donors and hire enough surrogates, then you can move forward and basically purchase your baby. That's what IVF allows. And it's, it's heartbreaking.